All righty. Well, I suppose we'll get started. The number seems to have starting to settle uh, the, for our participants. Uh, welcome everyone from home. Uh, hopefully you can hear us. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Candice Richards. I am the assistant curator for the Nicholson Collection at the Chow Chak Wing Museum. And as you can see, I'm coming to you live from the Chow Chak Wing Museum today uh, for our really special event uh, being held with our partners in the Hellenic Museum to kind of showcase our different collections and really take you on a bit of a journey through what we've got on display currently, what's in our storerooms, and so you can get to know us and our institution. So we're thrilled that everyone has come along today. Uh, you'll notice that it's a Zoom webinar session, so we can't see your faces, but I can see everyone in, in the participants list. Uh, if you have any questions for us, we're going to ask you to pop those in the chat at the end. Uh, uh, the webinar is being recorded, but as we are not, we won't be recording your faces or your details or anything like that in the recording. Uh, and live transcript is available. So if you want that, just go to your video and turn on the live transcript. It should be in the bottom bar for you to see. So welcome everyone. We're thrilled to be able to welcome you and share our collections with you virtually online today. So I'm going to hand it over uh, to Sarah to introduce herself and start off in Melbourne. Thanks so much, Candice. I um, appreciate that and the intro. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday. Um, before, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which the Hellenic Museum stands and where I meet you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So again, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Sarah Craig. I'm the CEO and Head of Curation here at the Hellenic Museum. Uh, for those who may not know the Hellenic Museum, heaven fourth end, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. The, um, we were established 15 years ago um, in 2007 by the late philanthropist Spiros de Mollis. Uh, he came over to Australia as a 12 year old um, in the 50s and wanted to give back to the Victorian community who had embraced him in a way that had cultural value. So his vision was to create a cultural institution that would promote the understanding and enjoyment of Greek culture, art and history. So over the last 15 years, um, it's gone evolved from a kind of community museum into a professional public museum run by a dedicated team of experts um, so the evolution was really marked, I suppose, by our first international collaboration in 2014 uh, with the Benaki Museum in Athens. Our partnership with them saw a significant, a significant collection of works uh, come over uh, for an unprecedented 10 years. So the Gods, Myths and Mortals exhibition, um, which is not this one, it's downstairs at the museum, um, it's divided into four major time periods, um, antiquity, the Byzantine period, the Ottoman period, and the Neo-Hellenic period. And there's about 200 objects on loan, um, and they are a significant portion of uh, the Benaki collection um, and some of their key pieces, which, are, which is amazing for us in, in Melbourne. Um, the collection spans 8,000 years. Uh, it's arranged in chronological order. Uh, beginning at the neo, neo uh, sorry, Neolithic um, and ending with the Greek War of Independence, which began in 1821. So God's Myths and Mortals is a bit like Greek History 101. It provides context uh, for what people already know or, and takes others on a journey through time where they can see through the objects, the trajectory of a civilization, essentially its influences and its influence. This is particularly good for things like VCE curriculum here in, in Victoria. I'm not sure what, what's like in HSC in New South Wales, um, but the, the focus of that curriculum sits between 800 and 400 BCE, which is an extraordinary period in Greek history, but without the surrounding context, um, it makes it difficult to make sense of what was happening, what was happening in other places at, the, at, the, at that same time or beforehand that led up to things. So the God's Miss and Morals is a really great way for people to get to know the extent of the history. So there's some extraordinary artifacts in this exhibition and I'll show you a couple of them. Um, we have the, one of our very, very earliest pieces is a crouching marble figurine possibly from the Peloponnese. Uh, it dates around about 
around to 5,800 to 4,500 BCE. Um, and it may have been worn as a pendant. Um, it's got a very small hole in the back of the neck. Um, and it probably had a potropaic meaning. So it was a charm, possibly fertility, because that was one of the key kind of criteria of, of the burgeoning culture, civilization, I suppose. Um, we've got an extraordinary pair of um, gold Cypriot earrings in the shape of a bull. Um, a, a maker statue of Athena, um, which is amazing in that it has the colours on it that the, the final statue would have had. So these, these smaller statues were made as a, a way of determining whether or not the, the purchaser of the, of the larger statue liked what they were going to receive. Um, and then they would make it larger in marble. So these are clay, which is why the colour has stayed on them rather than the marble, which we, we see now as white, would have been quite vibrant, uh, not dissimilar to this. Um, we've got uh, an official 19th century Fustanella costume, which would have been worn uh, during, possibly by one of King Otto's officers uh, during his reign, which is 1833 to 1862. And they say that each, there's 400 pleats in each of the skirts, one for each year of Ottoman occupation, whether or not that's true, I haven't counted them, um, no doubt somebody has. Um, and we've also got a Greek, uh, a sabre from the War of Independence but lead, um, belonging to Kolokotronis, who was one of the uh, leaders of the in independence um, and, a, and a hero of Greece. So the variety of items within this exhibition, um, while uh, diverse, so from Neolithic tools and pottery, jewellery to icons, we've got furniture, traditional costumes that you've seen, weaponry and manuscripts. It allows us when we're giving a tour or a workshop to narrow down on events and themes, um, such as art or mythology or trade, politics, and speak holistically to Greece's long and usually fairly complicated history um, while explaining its relevance to contemporary audiences. So the importance of having a collection like God's Myths and Mortals on display um, lies in its rarity of having a collection of this type and size in Australia. That's not to say that we don't have other significant collections in universities and, and galleries. Um, and here's an obvious shout out to the Chow Chak Wing Museum, who actually put a lot of a significant portion of their works on display, which is amazing. The power and value of these collections and their ability to highlight the influence of um, ancient Greece, um, the influence that it has on ancient and um, modern society in the Western world as a whole. Um, but it also allows us to interrogate ancient Greece's cultural legacy in the West um, and beyond. And we can examine and share the ways in which uh, ancient Greece has shaped contemporary attitudes toward art, history, beauty, power, amongst many others, often with us not really questioning or knowing where these kinds of perceptions, like our love of symmetry and faces, uh, stems back to ancient Greece, but it's not ever something that we tend to question. So there are inherent issues with this, which is something that we can draw light, a, a light to, um, which is important. Um, and we can offer the opportunity to explore and call into question what we've been told. Um, and so for me, the most valuable legacy of ancient Greece in this context um, was the kind of openness to new ideas um, and the challenge that they, they kind of put forward on the status quo. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So God, Myths and Mortals um, ends, the, the exhibition collection ends with the War of Independence, which finished in 1831. So the question, because that was our key exhibition, where to from there? And we decided to create exhibitions around this question, focusing, do we, you know, focusing more intently on micro, mi microcosms of the, of the topics that were inside God's Myths and Mortals. Um, and so you might, it might be sport or the importance of competition in ancient Greece, um, jewelry, grandparents, um, as a few examples, and while simultaneously exploring the impact and perception um, 
that these, these things have had on today's world. So <clears throat> since 2015, we've had a huge variety of exhibitions, many of which have uh, given our visitors the opportunity to delve a little deeper into a specific theme. For example, we've got our currently a Flame of Olympia exhibition, which celebrates the longest running sporting event in the world, the Olympics. Um, and features a full set of summer torches, but also talks to the ancient history um, behind the games. And the gallery that I'm currently in, Heroes and Hoplites, uh, Warfare in Ancient Greece, uh, it looks at the constant realities of war in, in ancient Greece. Uh, the heroic stories of, of the Iliad and the Odyssey um, were in many cases considered by the ancient Greeks as records of their cultural origins, um, when uh, with some of them claiming direct descent from the heroes, so the you know the great 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 grandson of Ajax or whomever. Um, and warfare in ancient Greece was intrinsically linked to politics, economics, religion, technological development, um, and so much more. So to look at warfare is to look at the evolution of ancient Greek culture. So behind me in the middle of this cabinet here um, is an, a Corinthian helmet uh, from the sixth century BCE. And this is one of the earlier styles of helmets. And so in terms of technological advancement, what things like this, which they make a lot of sense, they cover the ears and the eyes, all the bits that can kind of be lopped off. Um, they fit snugly, so you can't go wrong. However, over time, when they're battle tested, it turns out that perhaps having a helmet with your ears covered is not such a great idea when you can't hear what your, you know, your hoplite general is screaming at you across the, the, the battlefield. Or if you get smacked on the side of the head and it shifts and your eye holes are over here, um, all of a sudden you're blind. So the evolution from trial and error, which is, you know, sadly, they develop different styles of helmets um, throughout the course um, until they kind of stopped using them really altogether. So these exhibitions are uh, supported by and incorporate objects from collectors in Melbourne for the most part, but also around Australia. Um, and in fact, the object that I was just speaking about belongs to the Peter and Mary Matrakis collection. Uh, and we're fortunate to know and have relationships with passionate and engaged uh, Greek individuals and families who collect um, that want to share their history and culture um, with uh, the, the diaspora and, and the wider public. So the long-standing question of museums is how do people engage with artefacts? So artefacts behind glass are the way to, the way to keep them safe. So it makes, it makes sense from that kind of perspective. Um, but there's so much to be gained from moving beyond that. Um, and that's kind of, that thinking spurred us into the dialogue series, which I'll explain, um, but also our passion for object-based learning, which is having a series of objects that uh, everybody, young people and old can handle and have that really um, extraordinary visceral experience with history. So the dialogue series is an ongoing project. Um, it currently consists of four commissions, um, Onyiri, The Messenger, Renegades, and our most recent series with the artist Loretta Lizio. Um, so this series seeks to facilitate conversations between the past and the present through modern mediums, reinterpreting well-known stories or illuminating the lesser known ones. Uh, Classics and museums traditionally have a reputation for being intimidating, um, a, a bit inaccessible and possibly a bit elitist, which is something that we would love to break down. Um, we're all just a bunch of nerds really, and we like to talk about it. So um, we, we'd like to facilitate ways in which people can listen um, in, and they're comfortable. So we partner with artists, both Australian and international, uh, to create commissions that break down that barrier in, and invite those new audiences in, um, but also interrogate uh, long-standing themes and stories. So our first commission on Yiddi uh, was in 2016 with uh, photographer Bill Henson. He 
is an internationally recognised um, photographer. Uh, he's got works in the NGV, the Guggenheim. He was at Venice Biennale, um, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Um, he's known for his chiascuro, so the, the light and the dark is really kind of emotive visual uh, designs, I suppose. And the, um, the, a lot of his works have a kind of painting-like effect. They're actually quite extraordinary. Uh, and he's also known, he's probably better known for his risque photos of young people, to be frank. Uh, but, and this often overshadows his other works. Um, so to get this exhibition up and running, we had the support of the Benaki Museum. Uh, and so we, so what incorporated in the work was six artifacts from the Gods, Myths and Mortals collection, uh, which were photographed, uh, including uh, a Hellenistic era gold wreath, uh, a Bronze Age gold cup, an Ottoman era necklace, a knife, um, and you know, obviously in order to photograph these objects, we needed to take them out of their cabinets um, and to facilitate the photo shoot, a colleague of mine from the Benaki Museum um, flew down, she's a conservator, so she was there to look after the objects. And when we took the gold wreath out of the cabinet, you might be able to see on the screen, it's got some really very thin gold wires that hold the leaves onto the crown. And we lifted it up and put it on the head of the model. And the light was catching, it, was, it must have been extraordinary to see more than one of these in a procession in ancient Greece. The light caught it, it was really extraordinarily beautiful. But the very, very thin filaments were vibrating and we were so, so concerned that something dreadful was going to happen uh, when she was moving. And we were sitting at the top of the stairs and my colleague was literally chanting, I'm going to be fired, I'm going to be fired, I'm going to be fired. And frankly, I felt the same, it was all a kind of extraordinary moment. But the end result, seeing the object photographed by Hansen, which you can see on the screen now, in, in the way that it's supposed to be worn, was quite unlike any other engagement that we'd had with it up until that point. And, and when visitors now come and see this collection, it gives quite a different experience, which is really what we're after with the Onyedi uh, collection. Um, our next major commission went beyond the museum's collection. So we worked with Australian uh, sculptor, Sam Jinks, to bring uh, the messenger to life. We asked him to be inspired by the statue of the Greek goddess Iris that once stood on the western pediment of the Parthenon um, and is now in the British Museum, uh, but to do it in his own style. So Sam embarked on an epic journey um, in which he pushed the boundaries of his technical possibility, essentially, but we ended up with an amazing hyperreal vision of the goddess. Um, but because of the technical challenges, with the delivery of the work, it came right down to the wire. And the, she was scheduled to be um, unveiled in Athens. So that's where we launched that exhibition. And we, I had everything boxed up as the curator, had it shipped over to Greece. Sam and I followed later on the, on the plane and I met him at the gate and it was, everything was fine. Finally, we made it, started to release the stress of getting everything done on time. We arrive in Athens, we're going through customs. And when you put your, your bag on the kind of trolley x-ray conveyor belt, mine's gone through, no worries. Sam is, Sam's is going through and it stops. And this guy's looking at it and he's called his friend over and his friend is looking at it. And it goes through and, and the man says to Sam, do you mind unzipping your bag? And he unzips it and inside is Iris's head, um, which is kind of, it, obviously it's disembodied. So it would have been an extraordinary shock. It was a shock for me. I didn't realise he had it, it hadn't finished the head and it was in his bag, but um, it gave us all a moment. But uh, Hopefully they remember it fondly uh, as I do. Uh, so 
in, it's one of those works that can invoke awe. Um, and that's kind of, that's, that's a special thing, I think, when you, when you come into a gallery and you take a breath. And, and that's what she does, no matter which context she is. We, she, obviously, we have her here in Melbourne, um, but she's travelled internationally as well and always has, for the most part, has really very excellent reviews. Um, although art does remain firmly in the eye of the beholder. Uh, one visitor, when my colleague was asked, uh, what what was he thought of her? Said nonchalantly, "Yeah, she's okay." <laughs> so, eye of the beholder. So the dialogue series um, doesn't only live inside the museum. Uh, we've got three panels in the forecourt um, out the front of the museum as well, which worked quite well when we were closed for such a long period of time due to COVID. Um, the collection that's on your screen at the moment is by. Picciavo, they're Spanish urban street artists. Um, and we commissioned them to create the Renegades series. So these are three women who may or may not have been real. I mean, one of them is Medusa, so probably not. Um, but, but shifted the dynamic of the, the story that sits around them. Uh, and that was really important to us to bring to the fore some of these stories um, and not reinvent them, just make them bold. Because uh, so often women's stories are left out or, or kind of marginalized. So this is a, it was a, a fun, engaging way of bringing that out, I suppose. And following this, um, we worked with Loretta Lizio. She's a now Sydney-based, uh, well, New South Wales-based artist. Uh, and the first female artist that we've had in, um, in the dialogue series. And she decided to focus on three everyday women um, who didn't feature prominently in those big myths, um, but were, were tucked away in the history books, uh, but definitely had an influence one way or another on the world around them. And um, it was the pushing of boundaries, I suppose, which, which kind of ancient Greeks, both men and women were famous for. So the beauty of commissions is that they're open to the artist's interpretation. Um, they have meaning because the message that they're attempting to convey has relevance today. Um, and that really is one of the most important parts, using the past as a vehicle to better understand the possibilities of the future. Um, and hopefully Greek collections in Australia um, and their curation can go some way to add a positive value for our visitors. Um, at the very least, we hope that uh, they approach the collections in the same way that we do, in the same way that ancient Greeks approach life, um, which is with intellectual curiosity um, and a powerful desire to change the status quo. Wonderful, thanks, Sarah. Um, can you guys still hear me? With my headphones on, Sarah? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Sorry, I'm just double checking because I've switched over to have my headphones on because I'm obviously in the gallery and it got a little hard to hear because we had a larger group come through. Uh, but thank you so much for that whirlwind tour and we'll come back to some questions that I certainly have for you at the end. Uh, but first off, I want to acknowledge the fact that I'm coming to you from the Chow Chak Wing Museum, uh, which is on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and we pay our respects to all those who care for and continue to care for the country in this space. Obviously, you're all zooming in from different lands around the um, around Australia and, and probably around the world, I hope, as well today. And I'd like to pass on my respects to where you're zooming in from today and the elders and the communities from which you are coming from. Um, so the Chow Chak Wing Museum opened in uh, the, the very end of uh, 2020, uh, which is just as the craziness, oh, sorry, 2021. <laughs> Uh, just as the craziness of the, the world that we live in really changed. Um, I'm ex echoing and distorting. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, I will shift to here, where hopefully my voice will carry out to the gallery a little bit further, because I'm in one of the gallery exhibition spaces. Um, so we opened uh, the museum, and the, the Chow Chak Wing Museum was a bringing together of the Nicholson Collection, which I work for, uh, the Maclay Collection, which is natural history, science, uh, historic photography, 
uh, and our Indigenous and Pacific Islander cultural materials and the University of Sydney's art collection. And so the Nicholson Museum, uh, for those who don't know, we used to be located in the quadrangle of the university. It was founded by Sir Charles Nicholson, who donated a large collection of Egyptian, Greek and Roman antiquities to the University of Sydney in 1860. And then over the last 150 years, we've really grown and changed the collection. And we explore lots of different avenues of the ancient world, particularly from the cultures of the Mediterranean, North Africa and the Middle East. And so, one of the ways in which the collection really grew and changed, especially how we think about the Hellenic world, uh, was through one of our former curators, uh, William J. Woodhouse. And the exhibition that I wanted to show you guys or, or showcase today is really uh, an ode to William Woodhouse. Uh, this space that I'm in now is called Impressions of Greece. It's titled that because it was actually the very last lecture he gave, a uh, public lecture before he died in 1937. Uh, Woodhouse was, uh, of course, forward thinker in the world of archaeology. He travelled throughout Greece in the 1890s as a young student. Uh, he fell in love with Greece, as we all do. <laughs> and um, one of the things that he was really interested in was understanding topography and the geography of a place, because he thought that that was really essential to understanding the ancient history, that he actually says in one of his early writings that history only attains actuality through topography and geography, and by extension of that, the material culture. And this is the 1890s, before archaeology was really a discipline in and of itself. And so he was very much a part of kind of a new way of thinking about how we learn about the past. And what he did in the 1890s uh, was travel throughout uh, mainly the Atolia Icania region, taking hundreds and hundreds of photographs. And the photographs themselves are not the same as you have today. They were glass plates. You had to hike boxes and boxes and boxes of glass plates on your journey throughout the regions that he was going on. A lot of the area that he was trying to map and understand was actually some of the most mountainous regions of uh, Greece. And traveling with glass plates is obviously going to be a precarious journey for anyone. But what he was really interested in was writing a history that had illustration and photography. And over his lifetime and his several trips back to Greece, because once he came to the University of Sydney in 1903, he then spent several years going back and forth to Greece as much as he could, partly to build up the Nicholson collection of plaster casts, as well as to uh, further his research in topography and archaeology. And part of what he did is he always took a camera with him. And so it ended up that he had a collection of photographs that were donated in the 1980s by his daughter Liska. And the final collection uh, in the 1980s numbered about 1,800 glass plate negatives. And this is just a small fraction of what his entire uh, kind of photographic range would have been because a lot of them were damaged in a house fire in the 80s. And that is why they came from the Nicholson collection. And it's one of those kind of amazing collections that a lot of people don't know about and the Nicholson hasn't been known for. We're known for our ancient history. We're known for having a fabulous collection of say red and black figure ceramics. Uh, we're really well known for our representation of South Italian art in this collection, especially the area of kind of the ancient Greek diaspora or the, the colonies of Greece that spread out around the Mediterranean. We have lots and lots of examples of material culture from those parts of the world in the collection here. But not a lot of people know about this 1800s, what by this 1800s through to about 1910 photographic collection. And that's because it's never been accessible. And as Sarah was saying, one of the things that I really picked up from Sarah was that, you know, a lot of what our role is in the museums, especially in kind of contemporary curating, is about how do we try and get our collections to be as accessible and as open as possible, to invite as many people in as possible. And part of with the Woodhouse Photographic Collection, what we've done is we have digitized them all and made them freely available on Flickr of all places. And about in 2017, this happened and I put a call out to the community um, through a variety of different sources. SBS Greek Radio were very kind enough to uh, put me on and, and translate me into Greek. Uh, to be able to welcome the, and try and get people involved in cataloging this collection with us. 
And we've had to date about 900 responses on the photographs, identifying not just places, which is what I was hoping for. We've had people identifying costumes. We've had people identifying areas. We've had people identifying small churches on the top of a back, mountain in the background of some of these images. And it's been one of the real highlights of uh, kind of my curatorial experience is, is getting to know the community through the photographs. And so what I thought I'd do is just share with you uh, kind of some highlights from the photos and then talk about what we're doing with them in the gallery itself. So hopefully you can now see uh, my screen. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the photographs that are available to demonstrate to you the range that he really captured. That while he was definitely interested in the archaeology, he was definitely interested in the ancient sites of Greece, that was not all he was interested in. He was definitely interested in the people, the costumes, the experiences. Some of the photographs are a little bit more graphic because they come during um, of slaughtering of animals and things like that that were taking place, particularly over the Easter feast. And we have lots of photographs of those. I'm not showing them today. But he was definitely interested in a whole range of different aspects of Greek life that he kind of became a part of and, and enjoyed while he was traveling and researching in Greece. The photograph with the kind of group outside the church that you can hopefully see on the side of your screen there, the central figure is his wife. He always traveled with family members. His first 1890s trips, he took his mum with him. And there's lots of photos of his mum sitting on archeological sites, sitting on the ground, having lunch uh, and traipsing through some of the most wilderness and kind of wild mountain sides of Greece uh, that were, you know, passageways between massive ravines and things like that. And she was definitely on a horse going over them with her son. And then later in life, he takes his wife and then his daughter and son with him as well. And so one of the things that I love about the photographic archives is that he obviously had to be taking two cameras with him because how else do you get this photo without two? So he was definitely a man that carried a lot of equipment and definitely employed uh, local Greeks to go with him and carry that equipment as well as donkeys. We have lots of photos of him and the donkeys. Um, and one of the common things he does was the first series of these photographs were published in his book called Aetolia. It was published in 1897. And Woodhouse is absolutely one of the people that uses people as scale. Uh, it is a common trope for all of us archaeologists who travel around. If you do not have a meter stick with you, definitely shove a person in who you know the height of, uh, and it will give you a relative scale for most of these landscapes. And Woodhouse absolutely was a big fan of that. And the image that is behind me that I'll give you a close-up of later has a person sleeping in it that is the scale for that photo as well. Um, he takes, and what we've kind of learned through this kind of digitization process and putting it out there is how um, his photographs, while the Acropolis might be one of the most photographed places in Greece, his photographs definitely from the 1890s and 1910s takes a whole range of views that you don't often expect to see in tourist photos. Like he was very interested in understanding the masonry, he was understanding of a whole range of different aspects of the building. So he was never going to take just one photo, he takes hundreds. One of the great things about the archive is the fact that it, it captures a lot of these archaeology sites before archaeological intervention really takes off. And so we know that this is actually the theater of Epidavros in the Peloponnese. And we know that it was being reconstructed, I think, in 1903 or 1909. Um, and we know that this photograph is most likely dates to that photo because he's taking photos of the reconstructions that are taking place. And these are the only photographs known for a lot of these kinds of early archaeological activities because photography was not a part of um, the daily use in, in archaeology yet. It only comes in a bit later that everything gets photographed. As I said, a lot of the photographs are things like street scenes. There's lots of different photographs of the markets and the bazaars, which is really a fun kind of go through as well, as well as people working. And we've got a few photos of this little family group here um, putting out roof tiles to dry in the sun. And the other thing that becomes really significant about the photographic archive is the fact that he photographed mosques throughout the region as well. And a lot of these no longer exist today. A lot of different aspects and different towns have been built up over time. And obviously buildings are you know, useful things that can get repurposed and changed. And so this particular mosque at Larissa doesn't exist anymore, but we can confirm where it is based on this wonderful postcard that we found online to, to try and work out where this photograph was of. 
Because as I said, a lot of these photographs, um, I'll just go out of this and I'll come back into the slideshow in a minute. Um, a lot of the photographs uh, that you see in the collection are rare, they're unusual, they're different kinds of like landscapes that you might not see in other people's collections. But one of the really wonderful things about the photographs is the fact that they try and extend as far as possible and as wide as possible across Greece. And I think that that's why we've had such a really great response with the collection itself. And so the thing that we've tried to do in this exhibition that I'm in called Impressions of Greece is to match the photographs themselves with artifacts from the collection or even loaned in artifacts to try and tease out different aspects of Greek heritage and different aspects of, kind of this narrative that pervades about who owns the past. So one of the things that obviously has come up quite a lot in recent years uh, is, is this kind of concept of a Western narrative where we, uh, there's a lot of different proponents of saying that somehow this kind of Western concept of democracy um, comes from Greece, which is great. Uh, but then there are a lot of people have attached a lot of really interesting meanings to that and have taken it into really nationalistic ways. They've taken it, um, a lot of people have kind of attributed a lot of hate uh, and a lot of really weird nationalistic white supremacist kind of ideas to this concept of Greece which is really um, disappointing and unfortunate. And one of the things that I think has helped or what I, what I would like to kind of explore in this exhibition in particular is understanding that when these kind of ideas were being formed about this kind of really uh, Anglo-Saxon narrative or this kind of white nationalist narrative was being formed, it actually others Greece in a really weird way. That at a certain point in the stratigraphy of history uh, stratigraphy, if you don't know, is an archaeology term that, you know, you use the layers in the ground to understand um, time, really. And this kind of understanding of stratigraphy um, was that, you know, at a certain level, for some reason, um, we're just, the, the, the West has decided that we built, that belongs to the West, and then everything on top of that belonged to the East. And a lot of the times when um, Woodhouse is travelling, as well as when earlier travels were going around in the 1800s, a lot of the kind of identity was that the East was other, that um, Greece was part of the East and this other kind of faction. And you see a lot of the early travel books as going to the, to the mythical East included going to Greece. And so one of the things that I've tried to tease out in this exhibition, and one of the things that I want to reflect on in this space, is trying to put those things back together again and through by matching, um, say, the ancient material with this kind of the modern landscapes or that early modern Greece that Woodhouse photographed, we can marry these things back together again. And so behind me here, you'll see a beautiful Tanagra figurine, uh, which is a beautiful woman who's a dancer. Yay! I'm hoping this works. I'm just moving around now. Um, a beautiful female who's a dancer. Um, she's fully veiled. Um, these kind of figurines become very popular in the Hellenistic period. They show movement and dynam dynamism, and they've got a really amazing kind of painted outer layers for their um, cloaks and dresses and things like that. And they're often fully veiled women, um, and they're kind of in this kind of motion and in movement. And what you'll see is the photograph that I've chosen to pair this one with are uh, three different women climbing up the Pnyx. Uh, which is just off the Acropolis that you can see in the background, all in different various states of veils and costumes as well. And behind me, you'll see the Pnyx. As I said, you can see that there's a gentleman having a nap next to the scale, so that's your person for scale. And the Pnyx is very famous because it's where Pericles or where Thucydides um, kind of records in, in his history of the Peloponnesian War, um, Pericles' funeral oration that kind of gives a lot of the outlines for what democracy and what the principles of democracy um, meant during that period. But the Pnyx is not just one space. It's not just a shrine for this kind of beginning of democracy. It's also used throughout history for lots of different things. And this is a group of dancers that we have on the Pnyx, all fully in costume. This is most likely an Easter um, kind of celebration period based on the range of photographs we have of the same people uh, in different states of kind of uh, activity and festivity. Um, and then paired with that is actually one of the glass plate negatives from the collection itself. And it's actually the same group of dancers just all looking out, of, looking out at you. Uh, and because it's the negative, it's very ghostly and a very strange confronting uh, image. And what we've tried to do in this space was to really demonstrate how the Pnyx is not just one site, it's a continuously used, continuously evolved site. 
And a lot of the material that we have in the collection uh, from ancient Greece it is always connected to the places from which these are, um, they're always connected to the places from which they come, both for how they were used, but also to understand how they were used in society. We need to know in that Woodhouse way that history only attains actuality from having that connection to physical space. And so that's what we're trying to do in this exhibition. I'll go back to the screen share now, um, just to show you uh, some kind of pairings that are coming up or have already been. So this is the second iteration of this exhibition. Um, the first one, uh, as you can see on the screen, I, we have paired uh, the different ages of Greece and kind of, I call it the four ages of Greece in the back of my mind, because we went from the Bronze Age, this beautiful Kylix cup, uh, through the classical period, paired to this Attic red figure vase of Perseus' homecoming to Athens, paired with the Acropolis and a really fabulous kind of view of the Acropolis that I don't think you often see in photographs. Um, and then to one of the churches in the Peloponnese, uh, paired with one of the icons in the collection, we have a very small collection of icons as a part of the university art collection. This one was donated by Sir Charles Nicholson, but we've had more recently come into the collection through Roddy Ma and his estate. At the very front of the exhibition, you'll also see a range of uh, shirts. Uh, the Nicholson has about 600 or so shirts. Uh, and these were surface finds that actually came to us from Woodhouse himself. So when he was photographing, he was also acquiring artifacts. And so he acquired a whole range of different shows that represented um, the sites that he was looking at. So a lot of them are Bronze Age sites from the Peloponnese, but obviously sites get used over time. And so you might have a concentration of say Bronze Age ceramics, but you'll then also kind of factor in later periods. And the thumb itself was found um, and he photographed the thumb as well as the site that the thumb came from. And then in future iterations of this exhibition, what we're hoping to really kind of go through with this space is we might have changed over as much as is possible. Uh, my dream is to have it changing and rotating uh, much more frequently than uh, our exhibitions officer would like me uh, to change over the space. Uh, we want to leave it up as long as possible for people to really get a feel for it, but it will most likely change with the semesters and the university um, kind of undergraduate experience here. One of the pairings that I'm hoping to do is putting some of our plaster casts of the chlorae that were found on the Acropolis, um, that were buried on the Acropolis following the, um, the sack of the Acropolis by the Persians uh, on display alongside photographs of the Parthenon and other buildings on the, on the Acropolis as well. Uh, pairing different aspects from our theatre collection. We have a whole range of different uh, representations of theatre masks and performance in the collection. And Woodhouse was really interested in theatres and takes a range of photographs, including this one at Megalopolis, which is the first excavation that he worked on in the 1890s. Uh, we can also do things like pairing funerary stele, the grave monuments that, or fragments of grave monuments that we are in the collection, back with the Keramikos, the place where you would expect to find these in the ancient world and if you're a tourist in the modern world as well. Uh, we can tease out ideas about places like Eleusius. The Eleusius photographs are really amazing. So the, the mysteries of Eleusius are, are one of kind of a really... Uh, interesting area of cult worship in ancient Greece, the de dedicated to Demeter and the god of Persephone, and there's a whole range of different accounts of what actually happened, um, and it's a, it's a very, while men could participate in certain days, it was very a female orientated uh, festival and space. And what's really interesting about the photographs that Woodhouse has of this space is not just the fact that it's the archaeological site, but rather the real incursion of the modern kind of industry, because he's really photographing these places right on the cusp of the industrial revolution in Greece. And so at places like Eleusis, which is like right down near the port, you see the port being built up and the smokestacks around it. It's this real kind of um, beautiful kind of juxtaposition, if you will, of this kind of ancient landscape with this real modern infrastructure that was really changing the way and access to Greek heritage for the rest of the world. Um, things like the Port of Patras and the currents coming off of the ships is something that we're really interested in exploring. As I said, we've combined with the Maclay Museum, uh, well, the Maclay family collections here in the, in the Chow Chak Win Museum. And part of that is, a, is an amazing natural history collection. So I'm hoping to be able to work with my natural history um, colleagues to pull out some of the shells and fish in the collection that come from the shores of Greece and the Mediterranean region and pair that with the photographs as well. Um, and then coming back and looking at what women wear and how they wear it 
I think is a really interesting way to kind of explore this collection because there's so many photographs of different villages and different dress and different types of ceremony. Um, and we have so many different versions of this represented in the ancient material as well, particularly um, the way that women were expected to dress in the ancient world is not what often people remember. A lot of people remember the goddesses and things like the naked Aphrodite, whereas no one else is naked. <laughs> Aphrodite, naked, no one else is allowed to be naked in public. And the way the layering of dress and the different kinds of symbolism it had is something that I think we can really tease out through the ceramics and through the collection in this way. And so that's kind of what I'm doing in this space. And then I just wanted to kind of um, round up the, this by saying that this isn't the only space to find this kind of material on uh, display. In front of me, actually, I'm looking out into the exhibition called Mediterranean Identities Across the Wine Dark Sea. And this exhibition really tries to explore the whole range of different types of uh, influences on Greek uh, culture throughout the first millennium. It includes things from uh, Cyprus and the Middle East to try and understand exactly how influences changed it and how the Greek influence and, and what worked in kind of that kind of first millennium period, that there wasn't really this kind of homogeneity of Greek culture, but rather each of the city states had their own identity and how did they reflect that and how did they tease that out in their own material culture. And so we try and explore that in this exhibition. And then finally, uh, the other exhibition I really wanted to quickly introduce to everybody uh, is called Animal Gods. As you can, as I said earlier, in two seconds ago, uh, by partnering with collections that were not um, in the same space in a way that we haven't been able to before, we've been able to really change the way that we kind of think about how we tell the stories in the museum. And one of the stories that I really wanted to be able to tell was, um, you know, the story that a lot of kids and we have a lot of families come and visit us that love hearing about, and that is the Trojan War and the story of the Odyssey. And part of to be able to do that to, uh, for our audience, instead of just relying upon antiquity, we actually can tell these stories by using the natural history specimens that are named after the kind of gods and, and monsters of um, kind of the, that come up in the ancient Greek legacy that Linnaeus and, and people who followed in his footsteps named natural history specimens after. So on the screen, you can see that there's a whole range of displays. The beautiful big yellow and black butterfly you can see in the centre is Helen. Um, and she's the one that kicks off our narrative. Um, but then the, the two that I've given a close up of uh, are two of my favourites in this exhibition. Um, the, the, blue, the beautiful blue and black butterfly is the butterfly that's named after Ulysses. Um, and then and down the end of this exhibition, you'll see Ulysses coming up against all of the different monsters and, and people who, and, and gods and goddesses that he comes across in his journey. One of whom is Scylla, uh, which this crab is named after. And I love the fact that this is Scylla the crab um, because she has so many dog legs. And I can see how that people might have attributed uh, this monstrous name to this kind of monstrous looking sea character. Um, and we try and tease out these things in, in different ways. And as Sarah was saying um, in her, uh, talk just before, one of the things that we're really trying to do is, is find different ways to tell these stories, to be really um, interactive and, and to invite people to explore the ancient world and, and the culture of Greece in a modern way, in, in the ways that they want to, and in a whole variety of ways. So we have something kind of for everyone is what the hope is. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and so we've still got another 10 minutes, so I thought if you wanted to chuck something in the chat, you're more than welcome to ask us questions. Uh, obviously, Sarah's in Melbourne and I'm in uh, Sydney, and we're hoping, beyond hope, that travel and movement of people is going to be allowed again soon. So my, we might be able to do this in person one day rather than just virtually. Um, and I definitely, Sarah, can't wait to come down and see all the amazing work that you're doing. Um, so I'll kick us off with questions if you don't mind. So you've got a range of different artists that you're partnering with. Um, and so far they look phenomenally fantastic. And I'm really enjoying the way that they're kind of pulling out different mediums and different kind of artistic styles to kind of explore these ancient worlds. Um, so what's next? Have you got another partner lined up? Are you, are you planning on another kind of commission and in, in art installation? We are. Um, we've got a kind of, we, we've always got a kind of couple on the go because as you would know it takes a period of time to get these things off the ground. Um, we're talking um, with a Greek artist, an urban artist, uh, to look at our external panels which we want to change over once a year. 
Um, I think it's important to keep kind of visual interest uh, as people come past. But inside the museum, we're hoping to um, partner with a um, Queensland-based Indigenous artist who has whose work uh, challenges notions of um, colonialism, but uses Greek themes and imagery as a way of questioning um, the ideals that have come down from ancient Greece and also so we're looking to potentially work with him to discuss the appropriation or misappropriation I suppose you know depending on your perspective of of ancient Greek concepts by um, dictators and potentates and colonial governments um, in a way that actually negatively affects the who would have been considered the other I suppose, which which goes to what you a part of what you were saying before, Candace. So it's kind of really interesting that those narratives are starting to come out more and more. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, we do have a question from Gail. Uh, Gail is saying that she said that she believes that after the Banaki collection returns in 2024, if that's correct, um, what will replace that? And do you have more plans for material coming out from the Banaki? Um, where that's up in the air at the moment. So yes, we'll definitely continue to work with the Banaki. Um, they're an, a, a fabulous partner. Um, they've got seven museums in Greece. So they've got a wealth of material culture that we can draw on and, and some extraordinary, um, extraordinarily different things that we haven't really seen um, at, in Melbourne at any rate. Um, I'd also like to explore some of the larger exhibitions um, because that is our biggest space, God's Myths and Mortals. So um, there's, a, there's an exhibition called Gods in Colour, which I would love to bring down to Melbourne. Um, and that, that speaks to some of the things I was talking about before with the clay um, object, which was really bright um, in, in its kind of paint work. Uh, and it's a discussion around those kinds of things and all of the amazing scientific research they've done to, to kind of recrudesce those colours, I suppose. I was going to say, that is one of the things that part of the reason why I love the plaster cast in the collection, specifically those two corets that I put up earlier, is that one of them is highly painted uh, by Emile Galerion. Sorry, my French pronunciation is useless. Uh, but Emile Galerion was uh, basically the person who worked with Arthur Evans at Knossos to restore um, restore a lot of the kind of Knossos and, and the Nolan Palace that you find there. Um, and he, but he was also working with the plaster caster and, and made electrotypes and had a company kind of making reproductions of ancient Greece things to sell and Woodhouse bought them. But it's painted in the same way that the one that is in the National Museum now uh, has been, was painted. And I think that's something that a lot of people, even though we've said it quite a lot, and it's always been known when Woodhouse bought these things, he knew how colourful the ancient world was, but people continuously forget about. Uh, and it's something that I'm really interested in exploring more of as well. So I'm excited to hear uh, that you'll be doing more with polychromy. Um, somebody's asked uh, if we're recording. Yes, we are recording, as I said at the beginning, um, provided that it turns out okay and uh, it all goes ahead. Yes, we should be able to put that online for people uh, to kind of share and work with. Um, there's no more other questions in the chat so far, but I'll give it another minute. Um, I was going to say, Sarah, uh, the other thing I wanted to know about uh, kind of the helmets and things like that around you is there's so much bronze work in your museum that I was genuinely, I'm, I'm taken aback by it. It's such a, such a rare treat to have in an Australian collection. Um, so you've got five helmets there and some greaves. What else, what else is in this kind of space? Um, we've got, I can't, I can't wheel you around, um, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> but we've got um, a series of um, spears, uh, spearheads, uh, an extraordinary leaf shaped sword blade, um, arrowheads of different shapes, so the bilobe, trilobate, um, some shield bosses. We have an iron cuirass, which um, just the front part of it, and um, it's, it's not one of those kind of really muscled ones that you see on the gladiators um, but it does have definition and it was made of iron um, so it would have been surprisingly heavy to wear um, but now it's it's actually almost entirely it, it's almost rust really it's kind of held together with its own wow yeah it's it, it's a beautiful thing but um, we've also got a series of uh, black figure wear 
uh, pots um, and some uh, some rent figure wear as well, which which shows um, the hoplites in the process of putting on a pair of greaves or you know putting on a helmet or standing um, standing to attention. So it's it, it gives that kind of um, mo momentum, that kind of physicality of of the objects that surround it. Phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, Gail asks us about museum opening hours. So if you want to go first, <laughs> um, we're open uh, from ten to four every day except public holidays. Wonderful. And then we're open every day from ten to five except for public holidays. But Saturday and Sundays we're open from midday to four. Uh, so it's a varied time for weekends. Hopefully, unfortunately, we've had to. We were doing a late night opening. So when we first opened the Chat Queen Museum, we were doing Thursday. We had extended hours until 9 p.m., uh, which we were really excited about. And so if you come along to a physical lecture at the Chow Chow Queen Museum, it'll most likely be a Thursday night. Uh, and that, you know, the cafe stays open. It's got a nice little wine bar. Um, it's got like, and, and so it was a really kind of, we were hoping to, to have that ongoing. It's not open at the moment on those late nights because COVID has changed absolutely everything throughout the year. And obviously uh, until people feel safe coming back to the museum and being in person and being able to sit in a room together and enjoy those things together. So hopefully in the next uh, month or so we'll be reopening and for that late night extension. Uh, we've got a beautiful vista that looks over a park. Um, there's quite a nice evening, um, but yeah, unfortunately not yet, but soon, soon I hope. Um, a comment uh, from my mother-in-law uh, saying that I did a good job. So thanks. Uh, thanks for that one, Paula. Uh, <laughs> and then we've got a lot of congratulations. Um, May says, I wanted to share my confidence to you both. Concept and then execution of the exhibition shared is so exciting and enticing. And that's from May, uh, who I know is actually a student and is uh, at UNE and is um, doing all this work at UNE in the collections there and has been a volunteer for a long time. So I'm glad to see you here. I love it when students are able to come along to these things. Uh, Michael is recommending a visit to the Hellenic Museum. Each of his several visits over recent years have been rewarding and interesting. He looks forward to coming up to the Chow Chow Queen Museum. Perfect, because that's kind of exactly what we wanted to do today, was to be able to share our collections with each other's audiences and welcome everybody to kind of explore. So thank you, Michael. I'm excited to meet you. Uh, interesting, interesting. Thank you. Uh, Ruby says, what is, in your opinion, the best way to present something that has been saturated and antiquated, such as ancient Greece, to modern audiences? Oh, sorry. Say that again. I missed that one. Sorry. So Ruby says, uh, what is, in your opinion, the best way to present something that has been saturated and antiquated, such as ancient Greece, to modern audiences? Uh, okay. Um, well, I'm not sure that it's antiquated. I mean, what about Wonder Woman, you know? Exactly. <laughs> she, uh, she's an Amazon. She's amazing. She's on the big screen. I, I think that it's, uh, th these mythologies, uh, they don't have an, an expiry at all, I don't think. Yeah, no, I agree. And that, like, it's, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I know everything about that. That is never going to be true. I mean, historic people, it's funny, there's a there's a thing going around, I think, on Twitter at the moment that people are like, oh, you can't, we you can't rewrite history. That's like historians do it all the time. <laughs> uh, and us as archaeologists and museum curators and, and people who work in this space, we're constantly finding new information about the past. We're constantly trying to dig up different stories, trying to look at stories and reflect upon them and say, has this been told before? Has it been told the right way? whatever the right way might mean. Has it been told in a new way? Is there something else that we can tease out? And I think, you know, doing something like telling the story of the Trojan War through butterflies is a way to kind of reinvigorate, you know, people think, oh, I already know about Achilles. But there's this whole other side of things which people might not realise that the natural world around us kind of has this reception of this classical mythology. So I think there's lots of, it's never ending. It's never ending. <laughs> I, I quite agree, and I'm, I'm desperate to come up and see Scylla as well. Yeah, it's cool. All right, guys, well, it's three o'clock. I think we've answered any of the questions. Thank you all so much for coming along. Um, one last question. Yes, uh, postgraduate courses in archaeology or art history that are offered from your organisations. I'm at the University of Sydney. There's lots and lots of different ways to get involved, either formally through the University of Sydney itself or there's the Continuing Education Centre, which does weekend classes, and you can get a hands-on experience in the museum as a part of some of those. You can come along to lectures and weekend events and things like that here. Sarah? 
Um, we do classes and workshops and lectures and all sorts of object-based learning kinds of things. We just finished our summer school, which was the fifth iteration of it, I think. So we don't offer anything like, because we're not a university, we're a museum. Um, but there are universities in Melbourne that do offer um, these, these kinds of degrees. Indeed, so much. All right, well, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Candice. And I think Sarah, I think other Sarah is probably off screen. So thank you, other Please. Sarah, for, for joining us and, and helping out today. And I can't wait to come down and see you guys. I know, it's going to be amazing. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming.